Scaling OpenSec with a uh, shared nothing architecture session. Um, another term for this uh, you may have heard of is uh, called charting, so we'll use those terms interchangeably in this session. Uh, so let's just do a quick introduction and background. My name is uh, Craig Anderson, I'm OpenSec uh, Solutions Architect for Mirantis, and beside me is a Alan Meadows. <laughs> uh, an OpenStack architect uh, helping AT&T uh, architect a large number of sites across the globe. Okay, great. Um, so just to set the stage, the target audience here are, uh, would be OpenSec providers who require highly distributed large-scale deployments. Um, <coughs> one example is AT&T, uh, and it's their situation that's given us some insights into this problem, uh, and we've incorporated those insights into this session for you. So. Let's start with what is a shared nothing architecture? Why shouldn't we share? Uh, so um, the shared nothing architecture is a distributed architecture, uh, I should say in the context of OpenStack, is a distributed architecture in which each OpenStack region or environment or shard is independent and self-sufficient. Um, this is a bit different from your hub and spokes topology, which is shown uh, in the diagram on the left, which aims for a unified or global control plane. Um, now, most deployments aren't truly one or the other. They fall somewhere in the middle. Most multi-region deployments, for example, you have at least one shared service, typically either your Keystone or Horizon or um, others. Um, and one other note here, um, we wanted to make is that, um, that we're looking at share nothing architecture um, well for these distributed large scale deployments. Um, we don't think that it has a return on investment for if that's not your use case. So so why so why are we doing the share nothing? Um, so one the one key reason is uh, flexibility. So. You know, we want to be able to support different design decisions for different optimizations. Um, there's really no one-size-fits-all control plane configuration or design that necessarily will work for all your use cases. So if you are in uh, some organization, a diverse organization like AT&T, you have all these different uh, use cases and that, that can make sense to uh, diversify um, or you know enable you to have the flexibility to achieve that diversity um, another example is uh, if you want to let's say run different releases of OpenStack in in different environments now you've decoupled um, those dependencies that you had in hub and spokes topology perhaps so so now um, you could have let's say uh, you're stable you could even have let's say a stable environment where you run some workloads, and then a your cutting edge environment where you run <laughs> other types of workloads. Um, that's more readily achievable in this case. Uh, upgrades and updates, um, similarly, there um, you know you have flexibility with those as well. You can uh, rolling updates; those are easier. Um, uh, disruption planning is is also easier. Um, so uh, another key reason: uh, resiliency. Um, so we should think about common modes of failure, particularly when we're thinking about uh, like a hub and spokes. Um, so for example, um, if I have a shared Keystone service between multiple regions, um, maybe I've set up Keystone for high availability, but uh, maybe there's a common mode of failure like uh, there's a split brain or a partition in the MySQL cluster. Right, something happens that causes service as a whole to fail. Now, all of the other shards or other regions that were relying on that shared service are now have now failed, um, and that's not something that we want. It's something we would like to avoid, and then something we can't avoid in a share nothing architecture. Um, performance and scaling. Similarly, if there's a, if a degraded condition, underperforming shard, slow API response in one of your regions then that's not going to affect other regions. Um, so uh, there's also design complexity. Um, and this is pretty important as well. 
Um, this, the share nothing, you can keep the design pretty simple, uh, relatively speaking. Um, you can keep it in close to a well-tested upstream reference architecture um, and you know, get a lot better test coverage uh, in terms of what the upstream is already giving you versus what you might have to go off and do on your own if you're trying to invent something else. Um, it's, it's easier to deploy and support um, from the op side of things. Um, fault isolation, troubleshooting is, is easier. Um, and then also lastly, the, the, the labs in development are, are an important uh, point here, um, a pain point, I would say, for AT&T in the past. And I think that this is a really, this helps with making these uh, lab environments easier to set up and maintain. You want to lower that barrier to entry. You want to make it easier for your developers to, you know, contribute and uh, add value and to test and, and the easier your environment is to set up, then the easier it is for them to, to do that and make those contributions. So um, I think with that, uh, I'll pass it over to Alan to explain the challenges. How do, we, how do you make it happen? How do you make it work? Thanks, Craig. Let's see if my microphone works. Um, so one of the one of the first things that we had to do to achieve a, a shared nothing architecture um, was we had to virtualize our control plane. Uh, the virtualizing the control plane, it gave us several benefits. Um, the first was it allowed us to shrink the, uh, the physical footprint required for our control plane from what used to be 15 physical hosts down to just two physical hosts uh, for our smallest deployments. Um, it gave us um, new upgrade paths for the control plane, and it made the control plane uh, easier to contract and expand. Um, and these are critical uh, if you plan on running hundreds of control planes, and, and we do. Uh, last year at AT&T, we deployed um, 74 sites. Uh, there's another challenge, um, and that's the paradigm shift that occurs with a share nothing architecture. Uh, once you move to a uh, distributed services model uh, with centralized management, the issue becomes building the tooling necessary to manage hundreds of cloud sites. Um, and we build a solution that we call the OpenStack Resource Manager, or ORM. And the ORM is essentially a collection of API services. Um, and it has two fundamental pieces. Uh, the first is it's a resource creation gateway. Um, all resource creation requests, such as tenant onboarding, image creation, image updates, uh, flavor creation, flavor updates, um, all of these flow through the ORM. And secondly, uh, it's a collection of micro API services that allow our tenants to discover zones and their resource capabilities. Um, uh, the OpenStack Resource Manager, uh, as a creation gateway, it helps keep our sites consistent. Uh, this, is, this is really important because our developers need a consistent environment uh, each time they interact with our clouds using the ORM tools and operators uh, essentially to leverage a single set of APIs to inject things such as images, quotas, flavors uh, across either all of our clouds or specific cloud types like uh, small sites or large data center clouds. Um, another example where it's leveraged is account creation, um, especially in multi-tenant clouds. Account creation is a very complicated process. It's not just a username and a password. Uh, there's a workflow that all accounts need to go through at AT&T, and it includes touching both OpenStack and other things in the larger ecosystem. And to ensure all that goes smoothly, uh, the ORM acts as a gateway towards that. And our business rules for new accounts only have to be implemented in one place. Uh, the second thing that it does for shared nothing is that uh, those accounts end up actually getting pushed into the edges. Um, so that means that those actual zones uh, have uh, essentially uh, their own uh, control over the authentication and authorization for those accounts. So there's no centralized authentication backend anymore, so there's no failure uh, for that anymore. Um, the ORM itself, is, it's essentially it's a new REST interface that we developed. Um, but I, I just want to mention that the way that it manages uh, handling these requests downstream uh, is by leveraging the standard OpenStack APIs, uh, most notably heat templates um, that at and put considerable effort in developing custom plugins to enable service provider features. In addition, uh, the heat templates also lend themselves nicely to be stored in version control and uh, being independently tested. Uh, and lastly, uh, 
to help ensure consistency, there are local ORM agents running in each of the cloud zones that help ensure that that, that particular cloud zone has reached a consistent state without some central ORM process um, continually polling. And um, one, one last note, uh, the, the, the ORM also acts as a discovery service for our actual tenants that leverage all of our clouds. Um, the tenants can use the ORM to find various cloud regions they have access to um, and the capabilities in those cloud regions. Um, they can figure out what OpenStack services are running there, but, but also additional things like um, how much egress bandwidth ca capacity is in that site, whether technologies like SROV or DPDK are supported there, and other platform questions. And, and lastly, uh, the ORM makes a higher level cloud region search service available. Our tenants can ask the ORM questions like, give me a cloud site that I have access to in Texas, or give me a cloud region that's less than 10 milliseconds away from my calling IP. So thank you. Yeah. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, we'll be, and can answer questions outside or uh, by email.